Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Ryan Eisenberg, Executive Director of Achieve Kids. Ryan has generously agreed to share some of his experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Ryan, for joining us today. Thank you. It's good to be here. So talk about Achieve Kids and how you serve children with emotional and developmental challenges. So Achieve Kids serves students with complex special education needs. The students that come to us often have very complex developmental learning or social emotional disabilities. Very often in the public schools, those students aren't finding success and public schools will contract us to help find pathways for learning for those students. Students will come to us and we use a, ver a variety of different uh, professionals from behavior analysts, special education teachers, mental health therapists, speech and language therapists, occupational therapists, to act as problem solvers to help find a pathway for learning for those students. So how do teachers and administrators in the public school system uh, come to understand that a child needs additional support? How does that manifest itself in the classroom? We're part of a spectrum of services. So special education is designed around the concept of least restrictive environment. And what happens is schools will offer services to students to help meet their, their needs. As students demonstrate more uh, difficulty in learning, more services are needed, and schools will often contract schools like ours for support. Unfortunately, the, the way special education is designed, it often results in a system of failure for students that compounds their learning needs and makes it more challenging for them to access the services that they need. So then a child comes to you and you very often are, work, you're, you're behind the eight ball. How does that intake actually occur? I mean, very often students that are coming to us have very challenging behaviors, and that often um, masks what the true identified need is. And, and part of what we do is that sense of problem solving. And it's that team of people having protected time to meet and look at kids through data analysis, through developing relationships, through trying to understand what's happening in that child's life. You reference kind of early in life skill deficits, and, and reading is a fundamental um, skill deficit that a lot of students that are coming to us in the seventh, eighth, and ninth grade, they'll, they'll have five or six year gaps in their reading development. They'll be presenting with behaviors and it's important that we help those students learn how to regulate their emotions, but at the same time we have to make sure we supplement reading and get their reading to a level where they're able to enter back into the public schools and access the curriculum. And there's embarrassment that in a five-year-old is one thing, but in a 14-year-old uh, is something else, and in a 17-year-old is something else again. Uh, you really have to deal with not only the skills, but also the emotional uh, uh, piece and the physicality of, a, of an adult or, or an adolescent versus a, a young child. It, it can be seen almost as a moving target sometimes because there's so many different things going on in the, the lives of the young people that we work with. And you, you spoke about embarrassment and, and there is a, a, a self-esteem based um, issue when students are struggling with school and they don't see it as a place that's safe. And being able to form solid relationships or secure attachments to help those students find a sense of security in who they are as individuals and help them guide a path of growth and looking at how do I deal with challenges when they come up? How do I regulate my frustrations? How do I ask for different helps that I need? How do I develop my reading and be okay with where I'm at so that I can improve on where I'm going. And, and that's complicated. And, and really having time where our professionals can sit down and, and look at students and kind of carve that out in partnership with them and their families is so important in helping them not just get back to public schools but be successful within their communities as well. So you go through this intake process in which you're interviewing the, the young person, you're interviewing their parents, you're interviewing their teachers, you're gathering data, and you come out with uh, some sort of a plan that the young person agrees to. But that's not, of course, where it, where it starts, stops, right? That's just the beginning of a very long journey, and it'll be a journey with setbacks, and there'll be, uh, uh, it'll be a journey with achievement. Talk about how that journey, once you have the plan, what happens next? Well, it's not very different than any one of our lives. I mean, all of us have highs and lows in our lives. All of us have times that things are going really well and times that stress is, is making it more difficult to deal with those daily challenges. And the more we can humanize those kind of challenges and help people see that, that this is a natural journey that we all take, the better we're going to be at helping young people find opportunities and success. One of the things that we say to our families when they walk in the door is transition starts at day one. 
And what we mean by that is, is we're on a journey to help students build those skills that are going to be essential for them to be successful in their communities. And that looks very different student to student. For some of our students, it is language development. For other students, it's that sense of, how do I understand the social environment around me and understand the cues that people are giving to me and then react to those cues? And for other students, like we talked about earlier, it's developing their reading and developing some fundamental academic skills so that they can be successful. How does your funding work? Is it all through uh, contracts with the public schools, or do you also have a, a more diversified revenue picture? So uh, our primary funding source is the public school system, and it's that partnership of being an extension of the services that they, they offer. Um, because of um, some of the difficulties in special education funding, we look to do some fundraising to give kids the services that they deserve. Um, the special education funding model looks to um, incentivize um, identification of a student, but um, each student um, keeps that same value regardless of the level of services. So sometimes it works as a disincentive to give services. So knowing that and knowing that we're on the higher level of services, we look to have our fundraising supplement so that we can provide programming that we think is um, strong and programming that's going to help our, our young people get to where they need to go. And your total budget? Uh, we're about $11 million. And of that, how much is through contracts with the public school system? Um, just over $10 million. How many staff do you have? So we have close to 100 staff members. So what is next for Achieve Kids? You have an $11 million budget, $10 million uh, of that comes from uh, contracts. You raise about a million dollars. Are you going to uh, expand your programs? Is it really about improving services to the cohort of students that you currently um, serve? Are you, are you looking to scale? Uh, what, what is your direction over the next three, five, and ten years? That's, that's a great question. I mean, we want to re-professionalize special education. You know, we were just talking about some of those stigmas, and, and right now, special education as an industry is, is looked down upon. And, and what I see is a challenge out there, a challenge to develop professionals that are quality within our field, a challenge to say, here's a model that works for these students and this is how to help them access learning. There's a, a way to bridge research and, and practice and helping to close that gap and to do it on a level, um, on our level, and then be able to pass that on to the public school network so that we have more professionals in the field, we have more kids achieving in the field, and we're, we're having solid outcomes. And the first thing we need to do is to change that nomenclature from special education and disability to enhanced education and challenge and, and make it exciting, make it sexy, make it the thing that, that the most talented teachers who want to dedicate themselves to individuals and, and helping those individuals blossom, uh, uh, that's, that, that's part of the challenge that you face as well. It's a, it, it's a consciousness raising a challenge in society. Yeah, you know, I, I always loved learning and it fascinated me when I looked around my classrooms and didn't see all kids enjoying learning the way that I did. And, and I started to dedicate my life to trying to figure out why that was and what kind of things were happening. And there's an intellectual challenge that goes to trying to diagnose a learning difficulty or uh, a behavioral challenge. And, and that intellectual challenge really engaged me in learning and, and it helped me improve as an individual. I think it helped me lead organizations to be better and it's, and it's helped other young people grow as, as people as well. And, and I want to offer that same intellectual challenge to other professionals that are out there because it's a fascinating field to be in. It's a field that looks at brain research. It's a field that looks at educational design. It's a, a field that looks at mental health and it has this wealth of other networks that are available to it. And, and I think that special education really can draw in some quality people. Ryan Eisenberg, thank you so much for explaining the work of Achieve Kids. Thank you so much for your work in the field of enhanced education for, for young people with needs. And thank you so much for your insights. Thank you.